Hello, and welcome to Bottomless Coffee. My name is Jerome Evans, and on this show, we have conversations with people who are having a positive impact on the world around them. And we have those conversations over coffee, or chai, or chamomile. Honestly, as long as the conversation is good, our guests can drink whatever they want. Today, we're talking with Dr. Nathan Chomilo. Dr. Chomilo is medical director for the state of Minnesota's Medicaid and Minnesota Care programs, and a general pediat pediatrician, and an internal medicine hospitalist with Park Nicolet Health Services and Health Partners. And important to our conversation today, for much of 2021, Dr. Chomilo led the Minnesota Department of Health's vaccine equity team. Welcome, 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 Dr. Chomilo. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Jerome. Yes. Okay, so we talk a lot about equity mm -hmm. on this show. And I have found that different people may have different definitions of what that word means, that word equity, depending on their personal context. So for you, when you were leading the state of Minnesota's, uh, I guess, COVID-19 vaccine equity efforts, mm -hmm. uh, what was your working definition of the word equity? That's a, a great point. And I usually try to start any kind of talks Whenever I enter a space working with an organization or you know group of other professionals, let's have some shared understanding yeah. of what we're talking about because I've heard equity used. It's a buzz term, unfortunately, mm -hmm. in many places in healthcare. Um, and it's really important to land on what are we talking about. And so with equity, we're really talking about equal opportunity, right? Um, and, and there's areas and communities that we know have historically uh, been under-resourced, mm. have historically been oppressed, uh, and actually been barred from resources yes. and opportunities. Um, and that's different than equality, right? And I think there's still a lot of folks who confuse the two. Hmm. They think, oh, you're working in equity. That means that we're just making sure everyone has the same thing. And like, no, equity means folks that need more because they've been um, obstructed from it or they have been under-resourced historically actually get more, hmm. right? And so when I approached the work with the Department of Health, it was, you know, we know that before COVID-19, there was pre-existing disparities and gaps due yeah. to inequities, the ways our systems were built yeah. to uh, uh, structure opportunity to things like housing and things like food and education and uh, economic opportunity that led to health disparities um, and those health disparities then increased one's risk for severe complications from COVID-19. Mm. Those um, uh, inequities led to distrust of institutions uh, that other communities could trust for reliable information uh, about how to stay healthy from uh, infectious disease, reliable information from interventions like treatments and vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so really approaching the work of vaccine equity means we need to re rethink a, how we get the message out about vaccines, how we engage communities in conversations around what are their thoughts, questions, concerns, and hopes around vaccination. And then how do we actually make sure our systems, which again, historically and to this day, uh, structure opportunity and access to healthcare differently how do we break down some of those barriers and make sure that when it comes to at least the COVID-19 vaccine, um, we aren't falling into the same traps that we do with other healthcare opportunities. Um, and so that is, was really the kind of thrust there. And then the other key thing is yeah. a lot of the work around vaccination when it first dropped was around speed. And yes. how do we get vaccines out as fast as possible? Well, again, think about what we just talked about with how our systems were structured. If we're not going to change anything about them, but we're going to try to pressure them to go as fast as possible, we are inherently going to see more inequity, more disparity, and our community is left behind. And so how do we balance this need to protect communities, getting them access to vaccination as quickly as possible, while also making sure we don't leave communities behind like we have historically? Uh, well, that sounds like it was a big job. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the work that you put in. What I think I'm hearing is that when you were thinking about vaccine equity at the time in that position, you were really looking at, you were taking a systemic view. And 
uh, you, there was some pressure uh, given the scarcity of the vaccine and given the urgent need to get the vaccine as quickly as possible. And so there was some tension there. Uh, now, uh, as a, when I, again, to that, coming back to that personal definition of equity, as a gay man and a black man, when I hear equity, I'm like, oh, what are they taking from me this time? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and so I try to go all the way back to 2021 in my mind. And uh, I wasn't, I don't think I was able to get a vaccine like immediately when I wanted one. And I wonder how much of that is informed by the fact that at least at that time, it made sense to give vaccines to people who were older, uh, people who were immunocompromised, and what have you. Um, is, that the, is that the approach that the department took? Because I'm pretty sure it is. Because I remember there was like a calendar, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I think it was like, these people get it first. Yep. And when I looked at that calendar, I was like, okay, um, this is Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the older people are white people. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so this goes to a kind of a broader conversation that right at the beginning of the pandemic um, was around how do you allocate scarce medical resources in the midst of a crisis or emergency? Yes. And, you know, the, a lot of the frameworks um, that have been done over the course of the years um, thought about, you know, a flu pandemic, you know, you know, what we might do. And so that was kind of the starting basis. Um, but almost all of them, um, you know, initially that when I looked through it were colorblind mm -hmm. and they were that meaning that they did not take into effect um, or consideration the impact of structural racism and structural inequity on that. Not everyone is entering a pandemic from the same starting point. Yeah. And so then if you're assuming everyone's going to go through this, you know, uh, time of crisis, um, you're going to see you know, the inequities that are already baked in worsen. And so there was actually a lot of guidelines around, you know, from national organizations uh, starting in the fall of 2020, as we thought vaccines were coming closer, that said, this is how you could equitably distribute uh, vaccines and engage with community. And the Minnesota Department of Health actually had its own mm -hmm. uh, work group that I was actually a part of uh, as uh, Medicaid medical director um, to uh, inform what were those recommendations that you saw coming out in like the different calendars, yeah. phase 1A and 1B and 1C. And initially we were following the rec you know, the Department of Health was following those recommendations, uh, right? And uh, as you said, prioritizing folks who lived in some of the highest risk settings, right? Mm -hmm. We know that in the first year of the pandemic, uh, a large number of deaths were in um, uh, congregate care settings, nursing homes, yeah. um, group homes, things like that amongst our elders. Um, and so really making sure that we helped get them the shots first and then helped our workforce, which um, again, if we think back to the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, we were in um, our biggest surge where our capacity is really stretched and we were worried about, well, if we don't have enough workers, you know, yeah. how do we take care of everybody? And so, so that was kind of the first phase. And then the second phase was supposed to kind of continue a progression looking at and balancing these things, uh, all the different risk factors. And you're right, folks who are immunocompromised, our elders, um, we know are at increased risk of complications, but we also know mm -hmm. that our BIPOC communities, our black, indigenous, uh, Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islander communities are at increased risks for severe complications yes. as well due to structural racism and structural inequity. And so um, the frustrating part for me and for many others was that um, a number of reasons starting from the top um, in our previous presidential administration. One of the last things they did in their last week is they put out this statement saying um, 65 and up should be, you know, the consideration. Yes. And states took that and immediately ran with it, but then didn't add back in any other risk factors. And so we were basically only looking at age and you cite cited there correctly that there's, we know different communities uh, in mm -hmm. Minnesota and around the country have uh, different distributions or long lines of uh, age. And in Minnesota in particular, our white population, our white communities um, are, make up the predominant number of our elders. Um, our communities are just younger. And so, and so that was right from, from the start of our vaccination campaign, putting us at a, a disadvantage um, structurally. Um, and so again, and then we add the speed piece to it, mm -hmm. um, kind of built upon that. And so, you know, really pushing on the Department of Health from 
my, my role is kind of trying to look out for folks on Medicaid, as well as my role in the community is looking out for our communities uh, and pushing for racial health equity, um, I think led to the uh, invitation to come and actually lead the work yeah. and figure out a, a way to kind of move forward that's more, um, uh, you know, has equity built in from the start. Now, um, I, I think in a certain respect, I do want to acknowledge that hindsight is 2020, or in this case, hindsight might be 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and those were, those were the circumstances of, at the, I don't know, top of the first third of the pandemic, top of the pandemic, who knows. Uh, but those were the circumstances of the past where the vaccine was not as available. Mm -hmm. um, now the vaccine is more readily available, um, but we are seeing disparities, mm -hmm. uh, at least in vaccination rates. And so are you, if you were still working um, with the state on those efforts, would you then want to devote more resources to different groups uh, than say the, um, the elderly or the immunocompromised? Is that how you would view the rubric? So it's, it's complicated because I think you can't separate the, the decisions that were made yeah. um, from where we are now. In fact, there's um, you know evidence in our kind of public health literature that one of the things that really influences one's decision to get vaccinated is the number of people around them mm -hmm. um, and in their communities that they see get vaccinated, have good experiences, talk about it. Well, if for the first couple months you're creating this disparity, then you're creating a lag in the number of people in community that have actually had the vaccine experience that be able to talk about it. And so you know you need to kind of catch up there. Yeah. That that takes time. And then when you connect that to all of the other disinformation and misinformation that's out there and how do you, you know, combat that, um, it, it just takes sustained effort. And I kind of often point that um, we have had a decrease in our gaps um, in, in vaccination rates. But, you know, these gaps are tied to these issues of structural health yeah. and racial inequity. Uh, and so we're not going to address that in like one vaccination campaign. Um, we're not going to address that in you know, yeah. even one presidential or government uh, governor administration. It's going to take real sustained action and intent. And so um, hmm. and so when we're thinking about resources, not only vaccination, but then you're thinking about, you know, how do we get things like masks and tests um, during different during surges that pop up? Um, to communities, you know, how do we think about, you know, structuring those in a way that um, we're making sure we're not, again, just like we, you know, we, are we learning from that mistake, yeah. to be honest? And are we like looking to focus resources, all different types of resources to communities uh, that we know have been left behind historically? And, and so that is, in, you know, I still work as an advisor now oh, to the, the commissioner of <laughs> Thank health. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's the type of, you know, input, you know, we, we continue to talk about is, you know, um, you know, there's still work that needs to be done to get folks their first vaccine. Mm -hmm. Now we got boosters. Now we're having shots come online for our kids. Um, and so we kind of, we don't want to kind of each time these new things come through, start back where we were in, you know, yeah. January, February, 2021. We need to, you know, take what we've learned and really be able to implement that from the top. Um, and, and so that's the kind of work that we're talking about now. That's wonderful. I love that because I am, um, I am a type A control freak mm -hmm. and uh, I try to control what I control, but I can't control whatever new variants emerge. Right. And of course I lose sleep over the possibility that a new variant emerges that is uh, resistant, let's say, to our current vaccines. And then uh, the messaging regarding the need to get vaccinated is lost in certain communities because we're not allocating resources or because we're not learning from those mistakes. Uh, so I'm very, very happy that you're still involved. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about you, uh, maybe personally. So let's take a little bit of a step back. Um, a lot of doctors uh, get into the profession because they're really interested in uh, helping people stay healthy, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I don't see as many doctors uh, taking up uh, more of an equitable role or taking this equitable, this equity approach? Like, where does that come from for you? Or am I mistaken and, you know, every doctor is involved in this and I just haven't noticed? Yeah, no, I mean, I think for me, it comes from one of the reasons I went into medicine um, was my dad uh, is, uh, was a pharmacist, retired now, um, and he immigrated here from Cameroon 
and whenever we'd be in community, you know, functions, folks would always come up to him and ask questions about, mm. you know, what I need to do about this ailment. How do I navigate in, you know, the system and get medication, or what should I talk to my doctor about? And so, to me, you know, being in that role was always like you're actually helping your community. And you know, so the thought of becoming a doctor was the thought of how could I not only you know work with the patients in my clinic or in my hospital, uh, but in the communities that I live in, work in, play in. Um, and in medical school, you know, one of the first things that I started to make me more crystallize how that could look was learning about social determinants of health is, you know, they were called when I le first learned about them, uh, mm -hmm. I like to call them more social drivers of health. Okay. Um, and so those are things we were talking about at the top, things like housing, environmental exposures, access to nutrition and education. Um, and, and so that's where a lot of my early part of my uh, right out, out of training was focused on was kind of some of those social drivers of health. But I'll admit, that, like it, the kind of overlap with structural racism and that mm -hmm. lens um, didn't really hit me. And I've, you know, mentioned this in a number of spaces. Uh, I'm ashamed to say in, until Philando Castile's murder, um, and you know, when that happened, that was like a mile away from where I mm. actually asked my father-in-law for my wife's hand in marriage. It's a place I drive by all the time. Mm. Um, and I was actually asked to kind of go and talk to different groups of medical students and residents about my experience as a black man in medicine. And, and on reflecting on that, really starting to th think about, you know, a, a lot of the kind of uh, reaction to those incidents is like, let's tell law enforcement what to do. Let's tell law enforcement to change these laws. Mm. And I think we definitely, there's, there's a need for that, but like, what are we doing in our own houses, in our yeah. own, and, and really realizing that in healthcare, um, you know, there's the same amount of suffering and pain and loss of life from our community members due to bias and yeah. racism uh, in healthcare. It's just not going to make like the front page news all the time because it's not a, like a split second decision or yeah. um, uh, as traumatizing that, that captures the news cycle, but there is a lot of trauma there. And so, you know, thinking what can I do as a physician to really help healthcare systems, my uh, your colleagues as uh, physicians and other clinicians address structural racism and where it works. Um, and so that's kind of been my evolution. Yeah. And certainly when COVID-19 hit, um, and in fact, that's why I landed at the job as a Medicaid medical director, because oh. I wanted to talk about structural racism in kind of how we pay for healthcare. Um, and so I thought like I was going to have, have to wait, you know, 18 months, two years <laughs> before I'd have some of these conversations <laughs> with folks in the state. Sure. And, you know, once COVID hit and then, you know, unfortunately, you know, the, the murder of George Floyd, folks are actually then ready to um, understand, like, you know, how can I yes. do what uh, and make a change in my work here? Um, and, and certainly when then the opportunity came to you know, work with the Department of Health, it's another way to really kind of show people this is how we can actually embed equity into our operations. How can we operationalize equity, mm -hmm. racial equity, health equity going forward? It's so, it's so sad that from these traumatic moments, some of us become more organized. Some, we, we witness something horrible or we're directly impacted by something horrible and we're like, um, someone needs to do something about this. And kind of what we're hearing, maybe in the streets or what have you, like that might not be, that's one way. Right, mm -hmm. like you can only fit so many suggestions on a protest sign. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a lot more that you can do. And within your own sphere of influence, I really applaud you for going above and beyond um, where a lot of people would go uh, to benefit, to directly benefit me. So thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Me and people like me, me in the future, I'm, um, I'm really appreciative. Uh, okay, on that, note of gratitude, why don't we take a quick coffee break and be right back. Sounds good. Awesome. Okay, we are back with Dr. Nathan Chomolo for a conversation about vaccine equity. Now, we've been talking about vaccine equity in a broader sense, but now I'd like to talk about where the rubber meets the road. So are there any 
policies or recommendations that you made during your time with the Minnesota Department of Health, or since you're an advisor that you're continuing to make, that we might recognize? Yeah, so maybe I'll start kind of like in some broader ones that okay. folks that are following it really closely might recognize or yeah. remember, and then maybe some ones that are, are, are more to our lived experiences. Um, but one of the you know things that we were looking for is how do we really target resources to communities hardest hit? Um, and for a number of reasons, it gets a little complicated to use race ethnicity straight up. And so mm -hmm. we've used a marker of uh, structural racism and inequity called the Social Vulnerability Index, okay. uh, which allows us to give scores to zip codes and uh, kind of uh, score areas based on their degree of structural disadvantage. And so using that metric, we were able to kind of rank all the zip codes in the state, um, put them in you know, different quartiles or like the top 25% or, hmm. you know, and then say, and go to our vaccinating partners, uh, the health systems, uh, the uh, local public health, um, uh, and say, you, know, you really need to focus on getting your vaccination rates up in these areas specifically. And we gave them data on where those vaccination rates uh, were for each zip code. Um, we started kind of measuring how they were doing, getting yeah. vaccines, first dose vaccines into uh, those community, uh, communities. And then we also looked at our own efforts in engaging communities and setting up community clinics which community uh, clinic efforts that we were able to provide funding to were prioritized by, you know, zip codes that are experienced the most disadvantage. Um, and that kind of structure, um, I think, really helped uh, bring an overall focus because a lot of the times in uh, equity work, you can kind of have, particularly in these, one, these big campaigns, there's a lot of folks doing things with different communities, but like, they aren't talking to each other and, and we aren't all kind of having sure. a shared set of, you know, where uh, are we moving towards the same goal, the same direction? How can we measure ourselves against you know, that goal? And so that kind of broader framework, you know, some folks may be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, we use that information to kind of inform the health plans we work with, particularly in Medicaid, and so that they were doing calls and emails and text messages to members in these communities Oh. and saying, you know, here is uh, uh, vaccination events near you. Um, we can help you with interpretation services. We can help you with transportation services. Wow. Uh, we can help schedule that appointment for you to get you there. Um, and so that kind of direct outreach, um, trying to get information about the shots as well as how do you access and schedule them uh, to folks was part of the efforts that we set up. Uh, and then the, I think the real kind of community clinics that folks are seeing mm -hmm. um, have seen throughout the, the pandemic, you know, we did in 2021 over a thousand different uh, community clinics um, wow. between MDH, our partners um, in, with local public health and um, the health systems, um, you know, over a thousand ones that were really focused on our BIPOC communities, our Minnesotans with disabilities, those who are unhoused. And so, um, and so those, mm -hmm. Uh, that effort, I think, might be the most visible sure. uh, amongst folks. And then when folks show up to that, you know, um, over the last uh, quarter of, of 2021, you know, from the end of the summer into the fall, folks were probably you're aware of the, all the incentive programs, right? Yes, Go kids get your shot. A shot. Yep, yep. And and even before that, there was the you know your shot to summer. You know, um, and what we heard really early on was that some of those incentives and like the way you access them by logging on to a website and giving your information and then getting something sent to you six weeks later mm -hmm. wasn't really conducive to like the community needs. Mm. And so we worked with um, our partners at the state um, to look at the funding we had available through kind of our federal funding streams, our state funding streams, which have some restrictions on them, sure. and then worked with um, the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. Some restrictions. <laughs> the Minnesota <laughs> Council of Nonprofits to stand up incentives that could be given at the site um, to be to give incentives like referral bonuses. So, like if you go tell a friend, "Hey, we sh I'm going to bring you help bring you to this." Uh, a community clinic to get your shot, mm -hmm. you get an incentive as well um, uh, to kind of help sh uh, appreciate, you know, the impact that you're having there oh, that's nice. as well. And so because there's been evidence that, again, that conversation with someone you know is actually as important, if not more important than, you know, some doctor you don't know uh, mm. telling you that you need to get your <laughs> shot, right? And so how do we really kind of leverage those resources in the community? Well, and so, so those type of incentives are, are part of our programs as well. 
and then really how, where do we kind of how can we bring the conversation to community yeah and so like the the effort that i've kind of been most proud and excited about has been the shots at the shop i was effort. about to ask you yeah so you know this is based off of work that Dr. Uh, Stephen Thomas at uh, University of Maryland has done for you know decades now, looking at how do you bring public health conversations into the settings where conversations are happening in our community already, you yeah. know, our barbershops, our salons. You know, so he's done a lot of work uh, around things like you know diabetes and hypertension, high blood pressure, and you know, uh, talking about other health issues. Um, and he's, with COVID-19, had some conversations and done some work around talking about COVID-19, hmm. you know, masking and getting tests and vaccination. And so the White House worked with him to stand up an initiative back in June okay. where uh, folks and shops could sign up for it. Is this June of 2021 or June of 2021, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, could sign up for it and get some of that kind of training on how do you have those conversations and where do you find the best sources of information to, okay. to guide those conversations. And so we then kind of wanted to take advantage of that and take it a step further and say, we'll actually help set up shot clinics uh, if you're interested in, in those. And so um, uh, Image Barber Shop, uh, Tito Wilson's yes. shop over in North Minneapolis was uh, the first to step up and say, we're really interested. Uh, we'd been working with uh, Kelly Robinson's Messianic Care and Black Nurses Rock to mm -hmm. um, uh, have uh, different shot opportunities throughout the, the response and said, would you really want to be involved in this? It would be great to have the uh, docs and nurses giving the shots be from the community as well, right? Yes. Um, and so, and that's been a great way to kind of, again, have the conversation and maybe you don't get the shot right away, but you go back for your haircut again in two weeks or another two weeks and there's, we're still there, still having the conversation um, and still having the opportunity to get the shot. And so it turned it, it went from like a six week pilot to now we're like over six months going, yes. going strong there. Um, and really that is part of my hope in stepping into the role at MDH is that so many of these things that we've done to address COVID-19 vaccination, we could have been done earlier to address other mm -hmm. disparities and we should be doing after we're out of this pandemic response to address the health and racial uh, disparities we see in our state. And so how do we keep these investments going forward and keep our communities at the table, getting the resources they need, having a say in how these resources are spent? Okay, I do wanna uh, give brief snaps to Kelly and Tito. Yes, I did yes. not know that Tito was the first one to step up to mm -hmm. you for that program. Yeah. Uh, they were on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly could sell me on just about anything. <laughs> so. Good. Good. <laughs> so I am certain that mm -hmm. she is getting a lot of people vaccinated over at the barber shop. Uh, but tell me more about uh, these broader systemic uh, not resource allocations, but the change that you're interested in mm -hmm. uh, seeing in the way that the, the uh, healthcare system, or maybe even just Minnesota's healthcare system, uh, addresses the inequities in our communities. Yeah, so I mean, if you look at any of the work around how do we build racial equity you know, into our systems, it really is grounded in, well, what has the community already been doing? Hmm. Uh, because you can look through our community's history, like we've had to overcome barriers for generations and found ways around that's putting it yeah that's, <laughs> yes yes and found ways around those inequities you know already um uh to, even to get to where we're at today right yeah. and so you know what are we doing how are we embedding that uh that strength of the community you know into uh getting messages out so information about health how do we stay healthy? How do we achieve our best health? Yeah. Um, and, but then how do we also, you know, there's resources. There's all, you, I think, feel like in 2021 in particular, it was like every month, like there was an announcement that the federal government was releasing this million dollars here and this million dollars <laughs> yeah. there. So how does the community get that and doesn't just go to, you know, folks um, not from the community who are trying to show up and say that yeah. they're, they're there to help. And so, um, and so I think a lot of the work that was done even, you know, before I got to MDH, uh, uh, um, officially mm -hmm. uh, by Kutau and um, you know many others um, to set up um, a branch called the Community Faith and Disabilities Branch yes. um, that really was focused on how do we get uh, information out, how do we get some of these grant funds out to trusted messengers and community-based organizations, um, folks who are uh, 
providing different types of media versus you know your standard for uh, news channels and the Star Tribune mm, and, mm -hmm. and NPR. Like and so and so, where are folks getting their information from, and how can we make sure that um, we're getting uh, funding to get you know those messages out in those places as well? And so, how do we keep that going? Yeah. Is the question. How do we keep it so that there are uh, folks in the Department of Health who are paid to be community liaisons? And how do we keep it so that when we're looking at it, we put out RFPs and grants that we are really prioritizing um, those communities that have been hardest hit. Uh, during and before and likely after COVID-19 as well. And so I think that's where a lot of my interest was, you know, one example being like the mobile vaccination buses. Yes. So that was a really successful campaign uh, last year that went out around the state. Uh, again, was really focused on these uh, communities that we know have been uh, hardest hit uh, by COVID-19 and, you know, structurally disadvantaged before COVID-19. Um, and that was great, but like, how do we actually keep showing up mm -hmm. um, outside, <laughs> outside of a vaccination campaign? <laughs> right now we have a need for getting folks information and vaccines for boosters. Again, we talked about kids. Yeah. We look at our rates on folks on Medicaid, they're lower yeah. as well. And we're coming up to a place where we might have to start re-enrolling folks in Medicaid once we're out of this public health emergency. So really interested in how can we, again, take that same approach and go out in the community. And ideally, like, you know, when the next pandemic hits, um, maybe there's like the mobile vaccination thing isn't novel because it's like it's done every, you know, April through May or April through August. And uh, and so now it's like last year they were showing up and giving us information about healthy eating and yeah. how to prevent diabetes. And this year they're showing up to help prevent us from COVID-19. And I trust them because they keep showing up, right? Yes. Um, and they've shown up and, you know, my parents got uh, information and resources from them and now I am as well. And so I think, you know, there's an opportunity here to really think how do we embed some of these and some of it needs to be done by the state, but some of it is important for our, you know, private partners yeah. to think of and how can they be a part of that solution as well. The, the idea that we are finally putting resources, directing them towards uh, aspects of the community that are trusted, you, you, yeah. you'd think that yeah. we'd have done it by now, but it's really refreshing to hear that those conversations are being had and those, that those resources are starting to flow because we do know, kind of um, alluding to something you mentioned at the top of the conversation, uh, there are resources going into misinformation yeah. campaigns. And so it is really important um, that the state does show up and does at least, at the very least, help disseminate uh, information in a way that people who are trusted can then share with communities uh, in a way that makes sense for those communities. Yeah. And this is unfortunately not revolutionary. I know. Like, you know, know, you go back, you read what W.E.B. Du Bois was talking about in like mm. 1906. He was talking about the impact of structural racism on the health of, you know, at the time the word was Negro, Negro communities. Sure. Right. And uh, and he was talking about how do you address that? Let's go to the communities and ask them, you know, what are they doing? What do they need? Yes. Um, and, and so we're here 100 years later and we're having kind of the same conversations. And, you know, my feeling is if, you know, my son or my grandchild uh, has to have these same conversations again, you know, then yeah. I haven't done my job. We haven't done our job. Um, we should be able to elevate it and actually advance the conversation to not recognize that it's needed. Like, how do we do it? How do we sustain it going forward? Now, speaking to the access to information mm -hmm. and the existence of misinformation, it, mm -hmm. it abounds. Mm -hmm. um, where do you go mm -hmm. to get your information? Like what sources do you consider to be authoritative when you are making decisions for your own family and for yourself? Yeah, and actually, you know, uh, if you go back a little over a year ago when the vaccines first came out, tried to do a lot of conversations and kind of open the window to my own um, process on deciding on the vaccines uh, because I wanted to show people that like, this talk about you know hesitation or you know deliberation is the term I like is appropriate you know in the kind of uh, extraordinary circumstances we find ourselves in, um, and so uh, you know when I'm looking for information whether it's about uh, vaccines or other therapeutics, I'm usually you know as a doctor I look to some of the authoritative scientific journals like the New England Journal of Medicine. 
I also look to colleagues in the space, and so Dr. Zeke McKinney is, you know, a, a, mm. a colleague here who is one of the principal investigators in the COVID-19 vaccine trial that Health Partners is doing here in Minnesota, and um, he's a guy I've known since medical school from our community that I knew I could go to and talk to. Um, and you think about other organizations uh, that are based in our community, so the National Medical Association, NMA, which was started over 100 years ago when black physicians weren't allowed into the AMA, the American oh. Medical Association. Um, they've put together an individual panel that's looked at all the data, uh, that the same data that the FDA is looking at in yeah. their decisions, the, the drug companies have gone and presented to the NMA as well with that same data to review it. And so they can ask questions and you, you see in their recommendations, they're looking at things that really do impact uh, our communities in particular, right? Like sickle cell, what's the impact on sickle, folks with yes. sickle cell? You know, what's, what's the impact on folks with you know, diabetes, hypertension? Um, some of these other conditions that we see more often in our communities. And they've put forward kind of recommendations on, you know, the shots and then other treatments as well. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, starting from, from there, I, I, I really try to find some scientific grounding as well as then, you know, folks in the community that I know uh, that I can, you know, rely on for uh, information. Now, at some point, Dr. McKinney is going to be Googling himself and he's going to be like, why do I keep coming up on that bottomless coffee show? Yes, yes. <laughs> that is really wonderful. And I think it, um, you know, talk, talk about being trusted, right? I ask you who you trust. I asked the same thing of a previous guest and they both said Dr. McKinney. So. <laughs> and it's also, I think, very reassuring to know that there is a body of qualified medical professionals um, who are acting not in a duplicative way, but you know, in addition to mm -hmm. the, I don't even want to call it the standard body. There mm -hmm. are multiple bodies looking out for us. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and at least one of those uh, bodies, those associations is asking questions that are directly related to my health and my family's health. Yep. Uh, and I think that will hopefully bring a lot of people some, some peace, some yes. peace of mind. And maybe they'll Google it for themselves. Mm -hmm. Who's to say? Now, regarding the guidance, because we are still in the middle of this pandemic. I say the middle, we might be in the third, this might be the very beginning, there's really no telling. Um, when it comes to the guidance, like I know you, I, know, I understand where you get your data from. Mm -hmm. um, when, you're, when you are deliberating yourself, uh, do, you, do you feel as though the state for the most part is making the best decisions for yourself and your family? Or do you feel as though uh, you take it even a step further than the recommendations? Yeah, I'd say um, for the most part, and that's a good point of, you know, I generally recommend to my patients that they go to um, American Academy of Pediatrics for mm -hmm. kind of guidance for their kids and the Department of Health, Minnesota Department of Health for kind of their guidance for themselves and, and their broader family in different settings. Um, because I, I do feel like they've really um, done a good job of distilling a lot of the information out there into ways that um, can make sense for, okay. for you and your family situation. You know, I think the difficulty in a pandemic is that, you know, some of the current gets pulled back on how science works and folks yeah, who yes. aren't really <laughs> steeped in how science works, look at it and can come to a conclusion that, you know, we're kind of shifting the goalposts or, yeah. you know, that, um, not being truthful initially, like we knew things all along, when in fact we're learning and we're trying to advance and, and, and adjust uh, as we learn more uh, to what the most recent data like can really does show. The situation is dynamic. Mm -hmm. Things are changing. And some of the things we started studying a couple of months ago are maybe no longer as relevant to the circumstances of the day uh, as the, um, the local media would like for it to be. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah, and so, you know, just the fact that we have these variants, I think, yes. is, right, uh, really frustrating for folks to kind of wrap their heads around, like, we're not talking about the same COVID, the OG COVID, as I've been calling it, right, right? like, right. that COVID is out there, but is really the one getting folks sick, it's like, you know, certain parts of the world, Delta, most parts of the world now, Omicron, mm -hmm. um, which has, you know, some overlapping, a lot of overlapping characteristics, but different ones, um, which kind of, then shift some of the, the guidance there. And then, you know, just in general, 
uh, it takes us a while to kind of study viruses and how they work in our body and the impacts they have. And so, you know, that information kind of is really kind of trickling out and, and we're now kind of two years in. And so that's kind of more of a time frame of when you'd expect more and more information yeah. to start coming out about um, some of these kind of just basic physiology things versus the kind of broader public health things. And so where that kind of rubber meets the road is, is really, really tricky and it's really tricky. And, and I have been critical about how the CDC and others at, at times have communicated that because um, I think there is opportunity for us to be more uh, clear in our communication um, and uh, for, from both sides I think um, it, it, there's at times been political when it doesn't sure. you know that which doesn't help as well and so um, and so it does lead to this place where like you know <laughs> where do you go who do you yeah. trust and, and, and that is uh, that is tricky and uh, but I think overall the Department of Health has done a really good job trying to distill it down and again um, has provided you know resources in a, a number of different formats languages um, and through different channels to, to help folks you know feel like they can have an understanding. I think they do a good job too. I feel like I refresh their uh, COVID dashboard too many times a day. I'm responsible for too many hits on that mm -hmm. one. And um, before we go into our coffee break, just one thought so I don't forget it. Um, when we're talking about uh, the length of time or how the device can be communicated to people, um, while I wish that the advice were every day responsive to the circumstances that even I'm just experiencing. I think the reality is it's like, you know, do I want good advice or do I want quick advice? <laughs> right. mm -hmm. Those two can be mutually exclusive and maybe that's part of uh, what I just need to deal with uh, personally here. But let's take a coffee break All right. and we'll be right back. We are back with Dr. Nathan Chomolo. We've been talking about equity. We've been talking about policy and about how to make sure we're getting the information that we need from the right sources when it comes to vaccines and boosters and the other steps that we'll all need to take before we're through with this pandemic. Now, doctor, mm -hmm. in these final few minutes that we have you, because I know you have to get back to work. <laughs> Uh, what is one or two things that you want to make sure that you get across to our audience before we let you go? Yeah, I mean, I think what are our common definitions so that we can all be working towards the same thing, yes. right? So again, thinking about when we hear racial disparities in this area or that area, those come from inequities, the ways our systems and structures were designed. Hmm. And so um, while we should always chime in when it affects us personally in a certain area, you know, what are the different steps you can take within your life to address racial inequity, structural inequity? Um, thinking, you know, uh, with the work I've done with Minnesota Doctors for Health Equity, for example, we really try to have physicians think the different levers you have to pull. Yeah. You know, one is individual. What can I do in my clinic and in my work when I show up every day to address racial and health equity? But what can I do with how I spend my money? What can I do with when I go to the school board meetings or if I'm on a, a nonprofit board or in my faith community? Mm -hmm. You know, what can I do to make sure that, that we're really talking and addressing these things in those spaces too? And then thinking about what can you do within your um, uh, different professional organizations? What can you do uh, when you're uh, advocating with your different elected leaders and uh, making sure that that is a priority of theirs as well and that policies that they're putting forward aren't making things worse uh, mm -hmm. at the very least. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they're addressing it and making it better, right? And so I think we all have a role to play yes. from that. And, and, and I also talk about we all have a role to kind of help our own learning and development because we've all been kind of breathing in this smog of racism as Dr. Beverly Tatum talks about. Hmm. Um, and so it's not only learning about the problem um, and what we might be able to do, it's also some unlearning. Yeah. You know, what do we need to, you know, re uh, address that, you know, we learned uh, that we thought was right, uh, but that really isn't right about how, yes. we, how we got to where we were at. And I think if we all take those steps and approaches, you know, I think we can help address the bigger 
uh, broader system issues. Um, and, and then, you know, and when you think about COVID-19, um, again, having those resources and going to them that are trusted, um, you know, Department of Health, yeah. finding the, uh, you know, healthcare professionals, public health professionals in your communities that, um, you know, can give you consistent guidance. Um, people feel free to hit me up with questions. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm on social media, <laughs> not hard to find. Um, happy to always engage folks there too. So, but, um, but really, yeah, thinking about what can you do to address health and racial equity? Yep. What do we need to learn and unlearn? And then again, how do we, how do we work together to get the best information to make the best decision for ourselves? Because we are in this together. We are not yes. going to get out of this pandemic if we don't work together. Right. We're going to keep being back here. You're going to have me back here in a year saying what's next with, you know, a, uh, with the variant. Not a part two. <laughs> with the variant, variant Kai is here. What, what do we need to know about Variant Kai? And I really don't want to be back. I like this conversation, yeah, but I really don't want to be back here talking about COVID. To talk about. We'll There's a lot more we could talk about <laughs> next year. And so, you know, please do your, your part to help us all get out of this together. Uh, you know, you you got good one. I could tell the caffeine was hitting. The co coffee was doing its job. I was about to say preach, but yeah. your doctor said, right on the prescription. <laughs> right, 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 right. Get my pad out. Okay. Right? Uh, 100% agree. We do not need to wait for another traumatic event to become more involved, to influence who we can and what we can within our own sphere within our own families, friend groups, networks, professional associations, jobs, what have you. Hear, hear, doctor, hear, hear. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. Could not be more grateful to you for taking the time. Thanks again for having me. And again, happy to be on again. And hopefully we'll have other things that we can talk about yeah. that we can address too. Awesome. That's it for this episode. I'll see you next time, everybody.